the important bit here is the biggest right you have as an owner of personal property is to sell it. The reason that you're able to sell it is because there's something unique and valuable about it, not because nobody else can make infinite copies of it, right? Mm-hmm. I can make infinite copies of the Mona Lisa. I can go online right now and right click and I can send you a copy of the Mona Lisa, not worth anything. But that doesn't have anything to do with whether the Mona Lisa is valuable or whether or not the, the ability to sell the Mona Lisa forward without having, without having the artist come in and take a cut or otherwise impede those rights is a valuable thing for those that buy them. The other thing that you sort of said is you have very few rights as an owner, and it's true, of an owner of personal property as opposed to intellectual property. And that's very true. But there's a, a complicated discussion we could also have about more rights. So when a company can impose rules on you for using something that you have fully bought and paid for, and they do, go look at your Kindle license. They have additional rules that they impose on you for using something that's fully bought and paid for. The reason that they can add those extra rules is because you're not allowed to open your own book without a copyright license because of the RAM copy doctrine. Getting rid of that is enormously valuable because it takes away a whole range of restrictions and extra clawbacks, sneaky things that the originator of something can add to it, can stick to it, and then stick to the people who buy it. A bunch, of, a bunch of sort of bombs in the barrel, so to speak. And getting rid of that by treating this as a personal property interest removes their ability to do that. You can put a big fat, you know, I could put a big fat copyright notice in this book, but it wouldn't do anything. Like I can't, I can't make you follow that copyright notice. If you buy a physical copy and page through the book, you have not, like you don't need a copyright license to do that. If I say you may only wear green shirts while reading this book. Online, you have to do that. If you do not wear a green shirt, you are a copyright infringer. That's the law. Offline, you wear any color shirt you want because you haven't made a copy when you open it and you own the physical copy of the book. So the two things I wanted to bear down on on the two, the two things you mentioned were one, yes, user rights, owner rights are moderately restricted compared to copyright holders but they do include the all important ability to capture the rise in value on resale. Mm-hmm. Second of all, which is, which is threatened then by part two, if we treat this as personal property rather than intellectual property, it really shuts down copyright holders ability to add terms and conditions. And guess what terms and conditions they add? They add ways to extract some of that money out of the aftermarket, after the secondary and third and fourth downstream sales. Um, so then so then, what are some places where, though, because your overall point is absolutely right, what's some places in which the nature of property is changing, especially as it goes to the court system? Well, we're running into this huge issue right now. Let's say you're an art thief and you steal, you know, people's first 5,000 days worth $69 million, you know, dollars or was when it was sold. Um, you get caught. Do you have to give it back? Turns out courts across the country have two problems. One, we have no developed law of what's called replevin. We have no developed law of making somebody give it back. The most we've got right now is an action in conversion, which is you took my thing, you need to pay me for it. Well, imagine an art thief who steals something that's very much on the rise. They're happy to pay, they steal it. They're happy to pay what it was worth when they stole it. They wanna capture the meteoric rise in value, right? And if they don't have to give it back, then this becomes a growth industry. And indeed, we're seeing a lot of people sniping a lot of accounts, right? All my apes gone was the headline about what two, you know, about two months ago. Um, so that's a problem. And also the nature of digital property is, especially blockchain property is different when we talk about the very basic concept of my property was taken, give it back in the sense that blockchains are immutable. <laughs> It's a court can't make the blockchain give it back. If they can find the person, if they can get their hands on the person, they can say, you know, we'll put you in jail under contempt of court until you give it back. But they can't make them give it back. It's without the private keys, it's not going anywhere. It's immutable on the blockchain. It's not like a court can order the sheriff to seize it and return it to the original owner. So those are some places where at the edges, you know, the traditional law of property is if you take my property, I either sue you and you have to pay me for it or I sue you and you have to give it back. That's a, that's a real basic 
framework of personal property, and yet it does run up against some some new parts of what it means to own something that's on a distributed ledger and that that can't that that you know a court can't argue. Now, I say that it's different. Thank you.